Hey, it's Warren Hewitt. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with my very good friend, Miss Mandy Perkins. Hi. How are you? We're shaking hands now. I know. Good. How official. I know. Um, how are you? I'm good. I mean, shaking hands with somebody I've known for one and a half million years. No. Feel, how many years is it? Ten. Ten. Okay. Ten years since I first started. Warren Hewitt, you were my first producer. Really? Mm -hmm. and, Did you know that? And you still like me? I do still <laughs> like you. It's been a long road, but we're back here now in this gorgeous... Your studio is amazing, by the way. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Muzzle Tov. So... Yes. In our 10 years of knowing each other, mm -hmm. we made... Uh, we've actually done lots of recordings together because we wrote and recorded together. We did. Solo stuff with a, you know, just acoustic guitar things mm -hmm. that we wrote. But we did an album together seven years ago. Is that right? Yeah. Eight years no, ago? I th it was like nine, nine years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Wow. I know. And it's coming back out. In a, well, that's a, that's very ahead of it. But yes, nine years ago we met. Yep. Ten years ago we met. Nine years ago we made an album, and it was awesome. We had a, like um, you produced. We had some sick people doing all the instrumentation. Oh, insane! Insane. Yeah. We had David Levita. Yep. Who just was a monster on a you know electric guitar. With Travis and, played on Travis McNabb. Yep. Who wasn't better than Ezra now's in Sugarland. Right. Then we had um, Dan Rothschild. Who lives behind. Nice. Do you guys still talk? We do, yeah. He's such a nice guy. Yep. Yeah. Who, for those that know his, or want to know his, Paul Rothschild's son who produced The Doors. Right. And then we had, um, we had one more. Oh, wait, Jay Clifford. Jay, Jay did string arrangements, played piano, and co-wrote. Yeah. Yep. And he was in Jump Little Children. Yep. And then I went to South Carolina and I worked with him a bit there, too. And then we had Ryan Tedder. Of course. Who, you know, is Ryan Tedder from One Republic and... Does a lot of amazing co-writes. It was right on the cusp of him yeah. blowing up. Yeah. You introduced me to him, you know, yep. in between his One Republic one deal and his next deal. Mm -hmm. He had like a month where he was just yep. free. And I made three songs with him and they were all awesome. And one of them began to be in the first single yep. off the album. Why um, Pretend. Why Pretend, which people certainly enjoyed. That was the MySpace era. Oh, yeah. I started on MySpace. I don't actually know what it's like to be an artist without... Media, social media, which is kind of weird. No, it's good. It's good because that's that's kind of the future and the present and everything. I know, but it, we, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's true. It's not very rock and roll though. It's not very seventies cool. But yes, I I began on MySpace. <laughs> I put a picture up and I met Warren. Which that was is pretty it. pretty much how that went. I made a couple demos, which are still on my bloody Wikipedia page. So I I, can't, I don't know if any of you out there know Mr. Wikipedia, but um, he's over there. I, Mr. Wiki's I over said, there. I knew it, Spencer. Spencer. <laughs> um, I made some demos before I met you, and for some reason, you know, you put them out because you're like, these are demos. I'm still in school at this point, yep. and it's in between school. I'm doing shows. I'm playing demos. I just began music, and they're out there, so they get put on all music. And for some reason. Someone makes a Wikipedia page. It's beautiful. It should have started when I met you, which is when, in 2007, which is when I began doing music. But instead, it's like a few years earlier with these demos. And the demos are out there. And it just just really bothers me. That, well, that's good. That's an illustration of the uh, the internet age we live in. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, as like, soon as you take a picture and put it up there, you can pull it down an hour later. But if somebody yeah. uh, screen captures it. Yeah. You got to be really careful what you put out there. I mean, if you were a teenager now, it's kind of scary. You have your kids and stuff mm -hmm. thinking about this, but it's forever. I still like the way we made an album. Uh, we made an album like you'd make a Frey album. We took a couple of months. Maybe it was six weeks total, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the classic amount yeah. of time that you take to make a record. Plus, we did all the pre-production by writing all the songs. Right. And by the time we got musicians in, Why Pretend in particular, we cut the drums twice. Yeah. To get the right feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did things that you do to make albums. Yeah. We it was a real album. It we was weren't an precious. Album. No, there was an, it wasn't. No didn't like was... the drums. Didn't like the feel on the yeah. chorus. So we just went in and recut it. Yeah. And, you you just... and it was you. You came to me one day and went, eh, the chorus isn't working. And I was like, I don't know, isn't it? Put it on. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's not working. Yeah. So and, it's true. And But that, that's hard to do now. You can't. It's, it's impossible. Really it's so much cheaper just to do things on a computer. Mm -hmm. That just the idea of getting a full band in there to play every single instrument. And we had strings. Yeah. We had strings. And we, we, cut, had cello. we cut the band live. So uh, well, it was live yeah. guitars, live bass, live them. drums. Lost you, my you voice were singing like 20 times. Yeah, I lost my voice like 
six times during that. Yeah, we. I was smoking. Do not smoke cigarettes. Were you smoking in those days? I didn't tell you. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, would, you would have been so mad. I would go out and smoke, and I would put a lot of perfume on, and then I'd eat gum. Then I'd come back in, I'd be like, hey, Warren, and I'd like go go on the side of you into the room. We had this whole conversation like, of like, yeah. you couldn't sing more than three takes. Yeah. And you had to rest your voice. Yeah. And then you'd be like, just one more, one more. And I'd be yeah. like, stop. And he would he would be like, and I need, I need the emotion in the song, um, especially on Everybody Knows, which was the first song I lost, you know, I lost my voice on. And he'd be like, please, I under, you know, I'm a producer. You're going to lose your voice. You won't be able to sing for the next few days. I'm like, no, I got this. You're like, everybody. Like, yeah. I'm just kidding. No voice. <laughs> <laughs> and and the smoking <laughs> and then ari would be like, like why did you leave a voice so i was like yeah. dude yeah and you and you would kind of get blamed yeah yeah but it was totally not your fault because you were like well, please i suppose That's it's the sort producer's of his. fault yeah it's you just have to do what you have to but do you, i mean you have a new artist they're coming in they're fired up like it was so fun we were in the studio 12 hours a day we get two meat we'd order two meals in um usually greek and we still do. <laughs> yeah. We still do row rows. <laughs> yeah. We still do. We did. We did row rows almost every day. I love row rows. And I drank a lot of Red Bull for some reason. Anthony Bourdain, if yeah. you're watching this, come to LA and do something on row rows. Yes. Or do something here. There's a Lebanese. I'll come. We'll, we'll take We know Anthony Bourdain does the. Uh... He goes around. He went to Nashville. He yeah. did it with like the kills or something. Yeah. And, he, you know, he goes to like barbecue places. He could definitely come here and do Greek well, thing, or Mexican food. Well, because well, it's actually a Lebanese restaurant owned right. by, run by Lebanese people right. cooking Lebanese food. So. Right. It's very authentic. Very or authentic. he could go to Lebanon. Or he could go to Lebanon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, we're touching on a very interesting point. I, it, points in general. It's difficult to do what we did now. Mm -hmm. But it's not impossible. And I think that... What you have to do is you have to have that filter where you identify. Look, there's several things about you. Okay, you're very talented, number Thanks. one. Okay, so you're very talented. Yeah. But as you're pointing out earlier, you were also very, very active at a time when social media was definitely not in its infancy, but um, you could stick your head out a little bit more because yeah. there was still this what I always call bricks and mortar thinking, which is still prevalent, but in those days was like, Everybody was dismissive. Oh, it doesn't matter that they've got a thousand mm -hmm. million trillion views. It doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. But it did mean something. Yeah. It did mean something. And now it's proven to mean something. Right. Because now everybody reaches out to other people that have, you know, what do they call them? Influences. I hate that word, by the way. Influences. Yeah, I hate it. Yeah. But you are an influencer in the producer in the producing right. pro but we, engineering world. But we, but we have substance. Right. Because. Um, That's not, true. That's true. But still, you'd still be called an influencer, I guess. It's a term given to people with or without substance, unfortunately. Yes, influencers can be yeah. like attractive people, either male exactly, or female. Exactly, wearing a and bikini that's... and walking around showing their perfect life. So I have a love, very much a love-hate relationship with social media, as everyone that does sure. a lot of social media does, I'm sure. Because I, the perfection of it, the highlight reel yeah. that you're seeing, you don't see like the bad parts of it. So you look at people's lives and you're, you're like, that's amazing. Like, Why can't my life be like that? It makes you have a fear of missing out. Bums you out and well, remember it's the not real. Remember the phrase, don't judge other people's outsides to your insides? No. Well, it's just like, ju <laughs> just because everything, just be well, just because things look good doesn't yeah. mean that inside, you know, people aren't yeah. suffering. I mean, some of the most, without going into obvious, people like Robin Williams and all yeah, of these incredibly exactly. talented people. Exactly. You know, they, they may well be mm -hmm. incredibly successful, but it doesn't mean that they're happy emotionally. No. So. Anybody out there... That's that's why I really try hard not to look too much at other people's social media and use mine, as I'm sure you do, just to try to reach out and maybe make people a little happier or talk to people that are interested in what you're doing, as opposed to just saying, like, hey, look at me, like, look how cool my life is. Because a lot of times your life is just not that cool. So there's a lot of things to touch on. So we make the record. And I remember, well, I remember going to New York. Did you, did you, okay. I did. I went to see Brower. You went to Brower. Wait, now we skipped. Yeah. We have to go back for a go second. Back. Okay. Go back. Do so it. So we have this album, and we, we finished the album, and it was called Bleeding the Line. Yeah. So it was, that was the first name of it, and it had most of the songs the subsequent album had. But So we had Bleeding the Line, and I was working with this girl, Katie, and she was on a photo shoot with Jeff Rosen, who was Bob Dylan's manager at the time. And she says, I know this artist I've been working with. She just finished her record. She does really well on social media. And this was, I was doing very well on social media um, as an independent artist when we, when we first began. And he took me to Sony, to um, RCA Victor, and to this um, guy named Fred. And they said, we want you to fly out. I mean, within a week. 
We want you to fly out. We want you to come showcase. And um, before I did that, I had a showcase in LA at the Roxy. I remember. It was awful. I, um, it was a really bad idea. I think people warned me not to do it. It was packed. Word had gotten out about our album. The social media numbers were growing. They were really big. I was getting hundreds of thousands of plays on stuff for real, not fake, fake stuff. I did the showcase with older musicians. Um, one of them backed out at the last second because he had to go on tour. I ended up with a replacement that didn't know their material. They were all 15, 20 years older than me. It was a terrible showcase. And basically, it almost crushed us because... You take this project that you worked so hard on, it was really good. I actually was a really good live performer, but I did a showcase before I was ready. And it just spread all this bad word of mouth because you do something when you're not ready. You present not your best work. So there's social media out there now. You invite people to come to that show and you're just killing, you're just shooting yourself. Before I used to just do things and just be like, oh, it's going to work out. That stuff doesn't work out. You need to be prepared. You need to put the work in and the effort. I agree. I also think don't put yourself into a situation to fail. Yeah. And one of, one mm -hmm. of the things about living in Los Angeles mm -hmm. like we do and living in one of the music cities in this country, there's many, of course, there's Nashville, New York, L.A., Chicago, there's so many, Atlanta, so many great towns, Philadelphia, that have incredible music scenes, Detroit. It's, <gasps> this is not the center of music in any way, shape or form, neither, neither even country. I mean, look at, look at other countries. But the point about it is, is it is definitely a place where a lot of people live and work in the entertainment industry. Yeah. There's absolutely no reason for artists sometimes to put themselves in a position yeah. to fail. It's like in those days of like MySpace, when you are, you do have great interaction. The music is building its own momentum. Yeah. There was no reason even really to showcase. No, the whole thing just combined was really good. And then I do this live show before I'm ready, set myself up to fail, failed. And I had to go on the road for a month. I had to borrow money from the bank. I'm still paying back nine years later, went on the road and got good. And when I got the call, when Katie met, you know, Jeff Rosen, who took, sent my stuff over to Sony, when I got that call, we want you to showcase next week, I was ready. Because I had put in all that time, I'd played 30 shows with this crazy band of 20 year olds that were just balls to the wall, just <laughs> crazy energy, yep. um, go for it. And it was awesome. And we uh, all of Sony came and all the branches of Sony came too. So it was just this like amazing time. I just gave my all and we got a record deal in like an hour. So basically what happened was we made a record, wasn't ready, was ready, boom. That's how it happened. So we made this amazing record. Yes. We did it at my old studio and it was it was pretty fun times. For me, for me it was a lot of fun because mm -hmm. I had just done a couple of relatively successful records. You did. And you just done the fray. Done the fray. August Anna. August I Anna. loved August Anna's album that you did. I think it was their third one. Second. Was it their second. Oh, yeah. I love that album. And um, you did some other stuff. You were um, Howie Day. Yeah, I done Howie. Howie, yeah. and so it was all that era. And then you had a break also. Mm -hmm. So you know, I met you. It was all timing. Like that's the thing about music. It doesn't often matter how talented you are. It doesn't matter how hard you work a lot of the times. It really is about timing. Are you in the right place at the right time doing the right thing? Because you, know, you can miss opportunities like this. Yeah. And if you've you got to be open to all opportunities. Yeah. That's, that's the reality. And that's, I think, part of the filter that it's hard. I, I, we talk about this a lot. You know, we're trying to mentor, trying right. to help mentor people is that there's no such thing as luck. Right. It's just identifying where to put your energy. Right. And, and I'm it's thinking timing. about it. It's not luck, but it's timing, and it's putting yourself in opportunity, putting yourself Creative in situations yeah. to be in the right timing. What was interesting? I think about it now. We did, I don't know, Ari will know off camera, maybe twenty writing sessions, mm -hmm. twenty times we got together to write for an album mm -hmm. that wasn't paid. No, they're all like, I wouldn't say spec writing because we knew we were writing for an album. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite a unique opportunity. I I don't know if that's that's tough to do these days. You can't do it. Right. Like the thing is, you and I, we did a bunch of writing sessions. We we're like, oh, this is like dope. Then we decided we're going to get, you know, go raise money and try to make the album. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't have been able to do it if we hadn't, if I hadn't raised money. Because yeah. it's such a big undertaking. I think that when people, they, you know, when people are first beginning, they don't understand that it's a lot of time on the producer. So yeah. if you're producing stuff out 
and you're mixing and you're recording and it's your studio time, you know, eventually you get to the point where you can't do all the sessions you want to do because it's so time consuming and you need to start doing paid work. So I know people get frustrated. Why won't this person work with me or why can't I get this back or why won't they split the master with me? I get it. Yep. It's, you know, one thing to be doing the songwriting. It's a whole other thing to be spending the next three weeks working on it. It's unfortunately also the reason why sometimes when you're a younger artist, especially younger female artists, you get caught in a situation where you're willing to wait around or, you know, be at someone beck and call or take mm -hmm. some maybe inappropriate comments to get into those sessions. Sure. And that sucks. You were never like that. Mm -hmm. You were one of the only people I met when I first started that was not like that. Not making, not everyone makes inappropriate comments, no, but I a understand. lot of people, you know, they're lonely or they're bored or they mm -hmm. just want someone to talk to. It kind of, it really sucks. It's the same in most probably every industry, mm -hmm. but it happens. You are not like that at all. That's one of the reasons I want to make a record with you when I first started, because you were not like that at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a situation once where I was working with a young artist and another, we, we went out for lunch and another young artist arrived. And they're like, how do you know each other? Who have you been working with? Yeah. And they'd all worked with the same producers. And without being specific, they were swapping stories and going, oh, no, this yeah. guy, that guy, oh, you know. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's really unfortunate. And that's basically a lot of what our first, our album's about. Mm -hmm. And well, um, we had a lot of bonding in, in, a positive, yeah. in a positive, negative way. How can I say that? It like was a, a positive way. You were my first producer. So you said, I see something in you. Um, I think you're extremely talented. I'm going to help bring out these parts of you, help you figure out how to record for the first time, how to make an album, how to direct musicians in a studio, how to see something from beginning to end. We got a record deal almost right after we did that album. Yeah. So it was a successful venture in that respect. So you just brought out the best parts of me. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, but at that time, the best, a lot of best parts of me were really angry. Because well, I was put in is, this... Is, is really that song because it speaks to, even though they're entirely your lyric, Yeah. it was born from a conversation. That we had about that we had shared our childhood. Yeah. yeah. We started working together and we realized what we were doing is amazing. Well, and I mean, we wanted like, to make it out. It was honest. It was so real. It was so truthful. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's like saying... You know, because you don't realize anything at the time. Right. Now, hindsight. So for me, with songs like Everybody Knows and Never Enough, yeah, it was, I'm not a singer. I can sing, but I'm not a singer. There's a whole different <laughs> mindset which come, comes from wanting to be. Yeah. I don't really, I mean, YouTube gives me a voice and I'm sort right. of in a few people's lives and stuff like that, but not like jumping up on stage and and having people, you know, it's, it's a whole different thing. I can, I'm just sitting in my studio with a camera going. Right. There isn't 10,000 people staring at me. No. And, you know, and I, if I don't like somebody's comment, I can delete it, you know. It's a little bit more of a controllable environment. So what I found was a, a situation where we could write songs that were, we mutually bonded over, and it gave me a voice. Yeah, it was cathartic. Yeah. Because it was, but when I listen back to it now, especially like a song like Condemned or, you know, Broken Window Pane, which are songs I wrote before we met. They're just there's a lot of anger. Sure. And they aren't that, complex it's emotionally. They're very just. Yeah. Yeah. So I look back on it. You know, we're gonna re-release it on Friday, which is really exciting. I ended up we ended up you know getting a deal from that album, and everything was going quite well. We finished it out. We added a couple songs. We added you know I, I did Alice in No Man's Land with Gabriel, Man on piano, and we. Just, we, we, everything was moving. I made a video. I was going to go to radio in 2009. Set to go, Why I Pretend, first single, uh, co-write with Ryan Tedder. And it just all fell apart in uh, 2009. My brother got very sick. I had a stalker. I had a stalker trial. Well, I was supposed to go to radio. So I had to go to a stalker trial and go testify at it. My brother is really sick. And my label head gets fired. And all of a sudden... They say, we have this album, it's current for the time, and beautiful you know, artwork, very good production, beautiful mix, Michael Brower, Mark Needham, every, uh, great musicianship, everything's ready to go, great social network, and it just all collapsed in a span of three months. And all of a sudden, they close the label division I'm on, they're, keep, they're keeping, you know, they're, they're not letting me go, and I just didn't want to look at the album for a long time because it was just so, it, 
it was just, we just worked on it for a year and a half. All this stuff was happening. We were ready to go and it just all fell apart. And it was just like looking at a car crash at that. Basically, that's what happened. It had nothing to do with the album, but the whole thing around it, even my name. I didn't even want to be my name. I was like, this is just a disaster. And I started a new project of Verona because I, I had to just walk away. I think the record would have been very successful. I think we had several singles. It was very current at that time. People really liked Why Pretend. It was, it was have hundreds of thousands of plays just on its own. And I feel like it would have done well and it never got the opportunity. So I have it back. And on Friday, we're going to digitally release it for the first time. And it's going to have half of the originals and then half of the acoustic recordings we did, which are still quite dark. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Paper airplanes. <laughs> um, yeah. Paper airplanes. Well, that was about Sid Barrett. Mm -hmm. We had some cool convos. You know, you brought out the artist in me. And now the stuff I do is not nowhere as dark because that was, you know, now I've learned how to, you know, make some silver linings on stuff. You just grow artistically. Um, you also pair maybe juxtapose happier music with dark lyrics or happy lyrics with dark music so that it's not just like this big uh. but at that time you got something out of me that needed to be said and I'm really grateful for that I think I still think our album's beautiful it's still hard for me to listen to but I'm still really proud of it I feel like we deserve we deserve for it to come out and whether or not 100 people listen to it or 100,000 people listen to it it doesn't matter it does deserve to be out there. And it's not not out there because it's not good. Michael then Brown. we got a record deal and we decided to change the album a bit. And Sony wanted to have it remixed. Right. Because to have it be a little cleaner. Yeah. As, it, as we said before, it was a dark, very honest album. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mix the album. Mark Needham originally mixed it. Right. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, and the time was moving now away from that more dirty punk pop rocky sound. A little more, it was moving a little more shiny. Yeah. So we were trying, even though the songs were still dark and real, instead of going to re-record with someone new, we used most of the songs we had, but they wanted to have it remixed. Yeah. So we got Michael Brower. He was on board. Michael Brower insisted I go to New York while he was mixing. You know one of the strangest things? Did I ever tell you while we were in that process? Was it Larry? Yes. Larry he was called... my A&R. So I, I, had mixed, I had mixed some songs, yeah. sort of rough, but maybe just a little bit more than rough, maybe right. spent an hour or two more, at Glenwood. Right. And Larry calls me during the mixing process and said, oh, I've listened to this. This is really good. Why, why don't you mix the record? Like in the middle of the mixing process. I never told you that. No. And I'm like, aren't we already committed? We've already had it mixed by one person now. It's just how Scott it is. So for me, it's like I'm starting. So I think we're, we're telling different portions of the same story, but it's a very, very similar thing. There's always this nervousness with the music industry to try and protect yourself with like, you know, like everything, as you know, and now as a writer, you're seeing everything that you get involved with. There's always like 15 different opinions. And one of those is always to make sure you get a famous name mixer mm -hmm. attached to it because it gives job security to the A&R guy. Mm -hmm. If they get a big name, I'm not going to quote any particular ones, but obvious names, if they get a big name attached to it and it's not a hit, they can be, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah mixed it. I did everything right. But there's right. less chances being taken on new people. There's definitely or... a lot less chances. Yeah. And some of it's in the music industry's defense, understandable. Because mm -hmm. if I'm in a record label now, major, the only place to make money is pop. Right. It's a top 40. It's right. the only place they can download mm -hmm. singles and potentially, not always, but potentially yeah. sell a handful of re records. Now, you as a songwriter, I, I mean, you, you know this better than anybody. It's like an album cut, even on some of the biggest al artists now, yeah. is meaningless. Yeah. I, I don't write, I don't work on like for other people anymore. Like I don't work on other people's albums or do any of that stuff. Um, but we have friends that are, that are big writers, whatever yeah. that means. They're not Ryan. Yeah. Ryan's obviously in a different echelon. Yeah. He's getting half a yeah. dozen top 10 singles a year. But other writers that yeah. we know that have a third or a half of a song on a big artist yeah. record, if it's not a single, it doesn't mean anything. Doesn't so mean anything. Maybe I, they're I, making 60 or 100 grand a year. Yeah. So I realized um, way back, you know, in between projects, I've had a couple projects since we've done our project. I decided that I tried, wanted, I love working with other people. I love doing co writes and working with other artists. And I did, a, you know, spend a year going in and out of different artist sessions and seeing, it. but I found that you do a, a lot of work that is never paid for. Um, you're working many, many hours for free. You often lose the songs because the producer might give their, if it's a track based thing, they might give it to someone else. If you work with an artist when they just, 
when they're just beginning, they might change who they are after a year. And you've spent all this time, but it doesn't matter what the song is like or how good it is, you might lose it for purposes out of your control. So I decided if I'm going to work for free, it's going to be for me. Mm -hmm. And I decided a, a few years ago to only do stuff for me. And that's when I started making money. Is right. that I do all sorts of things now that, you know, TV and film is a huge, huge industry. It is how a lot of artists and songwriters make a living now. And I do my artist stuff. I do TV and film stuff artistically. I do all sorts of things that I have total control over as opposed to doing stuff just, just as me. This is a big part of like, how do you make money now? You have to evolve. Yeah. You, the whole thing is you, you, people are like, how are you still, you know, sometimes you walk, you watch people, they're like, what are you doing these days? Like musically or what are you doing if you haven't seen them in a long time? And a lot of people can't, stay and pursue their passion once you reach a certain point if you're not making enough money and you realize i want to buy a house one day or i want to feed my dog like the organic food anything like being an artist is really hard you feast or famine right you get paid on quarters i don't think people realize that if your quarters don't overlap you're screwed some agencies pay you nine months to three years your yes. performance rights society i mean i've had placements in you know three years ago i'm just getting paid for so if you don't get your quarters to overlap, all of a sudden you're getting paid, you might not get paid for two months or three months, anything. Mm -hmm. So it's a feast or famine profession and the only way to stay in it is to adapt. You have to change, mm -hmm. you have to say, this project isn't working, I'm moving on. You gotta be okay of letting stuff go. And you're lucky, you get to work on this project this month. Well, I, I, only, month. I only write on stuff I produce. Basically people mm -hmm. come to me and say, I, would, I wanna write with you and I'm mm -hmm. just like, sure, I, 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 as long as I can produce the track. And they're like, oh no, we got so-and-so attached. And so basically right. what you become is I become a spec writer for another project. Right. And I'm just like, I'm too busy. Yeah. And and I'm not too busy just sitting with my feet up yeah. waiting for the phone to ring. I'm too busy hustling and creating work. Working for yourself. Working for myself. So yeah. it's it's not I mean, most of the stuff it I don't want it to sound complex. It's actually not that complex mm -hmm. for people starting out. It's mm -hmm. literally a case of when I started, I started in a small town. Right. Actually, a village of part of a small town. So, and there was a, a vibrant music scene. Right. In as much as there was bands playing. There was nowhere to play. So even though it's 30 plus years ago, it's still exactly like it is now. Right. So what did I do? What do you do? You, you find those artists. Right. And you, and you literally just help develop them. Mm -hmm. And you build a resume mm -hmm. and you build a skill set. And you have to do it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You can't You can't just expect, oh, I, I get here one day, look at me, I've arrived. 97% of my right. life has been unpaid, mm -hmm. unthanked, not appreciated stuff. <laughs> and it doesn't mean it wasn't good. It happens right. to everybody. This is not a terminally unique situation. It happens sure. to every producer, every writer, every artist. You spend so much of your time not getting paid. Yeah. And you and if you care, like you care and I care, and I think a lot of people care, it it sucks. It sucks because you're it's a it's a sometimes a very thankless thing to be an artist. But if you're an artist, you're an artist. I think it's interesting with Over Own though, because yeah. you also completely changed your sound. Yeah. Well I met a guy, I met an eighteen year old kid and he had just moved to LA. And I was done with being myself, not myself as a person, myself as my name. And I said, I just want to start a new project. And I met him and he had came with a sound. And I had things to say. I, I, like I mentioned before, my brother was really sick. I was really sad. And all this stuff happened, but I wasn't mad. Once the stalker and the firing and my brother got sick, I realized there, there had to be silver linings. Mm -hmm. I wanted to start putting silver linings on stuff. So our stuff was kind of dark, but it had a silver lining. And it was indie electro, uh, art rock. And I, I, all of a sudden, two years after we did that, there a lot of other acts started doing that. But when we started doing it, no one had, no one had started doing that sound yet. So it was kind of like, what the heck are they doing? And also, that got a lot of interest too. Like our project I got a lot of interest. That got a lot of interest too. Unfortunately, in some situations, what had happened on our album that I mentioned before kind of went into my new album because... We had we had so much politics behind what happened with the Alice album that some of those people were still in charge and didn't like the person that signed me in the first place. And it bled into my next project. 
some people that were at that disaster showcase where I set myself up to fail. Totally my fault. Every you got you and Ari said, do not do the show. I said, I'm doing the show. You guys don't know what you're saying. Failed. Went into that project. So it was just, it's just constantly, as an artist, you're constantly trying to overcome maybe an obstacle that some people are focusing on from the past that has nothing to do with your future. So it's tough. Here, here, here's something which is contentious and I have said before, but I'll, 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 I'll say out loud. Um, <laughs> when it comes to, to, to labels and business people and stuff yeah. like that, look, the reality is, is there's a, a thousand people putting out an album, say. Yes. Take a nice round number. The chances are that only one of those will make a lot of money and then maybe three of them mm -hmm. or four of them will recoup the mm -hmm. costs. So it's a good 997 are going to just disappear and you're never going to hear of them again. Right. So it's very easy for an industry person to go to any kind of showcase, listen to any kind of demo and say, this sucks because, and then give five reasons. Because they're always, they're going to be right. I remember specifically, and you and I talked about this when we first started working, I remember specifically being in a parking lot with Mike Flynn at the back of track records when it still existed, listening to Over My Head, which I don't think was called Cable Car. No, it was called, it was called Cable Car, not Over My Head. Right. Because it was written about Isaac's brother, Caleb. Right. Because it was written about him, instead of calling it Caleb, he called it Cable Car. Like right. A, like a nickname. It was a great song. It's a great song. They yeah. hadn't finished How to Save a Life, the song yet. Right. That was in the process of writing. And we sat there, like, listening to... If it wasn't a cassette, it was a CD demo. Right. And he's like, what do you think? He goes, I'm really excited. And I'm like, who knows about it? He goes, absolutely nobody. Right. Nobody knows about this band. It came up in research that they were getting local play. Yeah. And so I started following them and blah, blah, blah. Right. He'd already flown out and met with them and nobody cared and nothing. Right. And um, he's like, what do you think? And I was like... I loved it because he, he had that falsetto, which right. at that time was just starting to hit, you know, obviously mm -hmm. Coldplay had it, but American artists hadn't quite got it on my head, you know, hadn't quite right. got that. Plus he had that gruff, almost um, Americana voice at the right. same time. So it, like it hit all of the things for me personally, because I love old rock and roll and I like new, you know what I mean? I love all music. So I was excited. He was excited because, you know, Mike had played with Mellencamp. So it hit him from that level. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, he signed them made the record, record comes out, they get huge. But for that period when they weren't huge, for like six months, they were selling three to 10,000 records a week in their local area. And so they were at like four, five, six, seven hundred. 700, I think they hit 700,000 records without anybody acknowledging they existed. And then they got Grey's Anatomy, How to Save a Life, end credit, whole scene, played like, I don't know, two minutes of the song right. or whatever it was. And they went to like one or two million. Right. And everybody I met in the industry was like, oh, yeah, the fray. They're only huge because of Grey's Anatomy. Because nobody, nobody had seen the band. Mm -hmm. Nobody cared about the band. Mm -hmm. And then I started taking meetings with A&R guys who wanted to work with me because mm -hmm. of the association. And they were like, yeah, I, w I was there early. I'm like, no, you weren't. Yeah. Or I found them or I, I saw them. I found them and I saw them and I tried yeah. to sign them and I yeah. got blocked. And yeah. It's like, that's our business. Yeah. You don't know until you know and nobody knows. Yeah. And the great really American don't. public decides who's going to be successful. And even if you, you, they also, a lot of people don't trust their own ears. Sure. So if you hear something through someone through someone, you don't even bother listening to it or thinking about it for yourself or going to see a show We or took a meeting with an A&R guy who hadn't even heard the record and we mm. listened to it for the first time with him in the room. Do you remember that? No, but I remember somebody telling me I looked too much like Avril Lavigne and it was going to be a problem. the same guy. Like, what am I going to do? Rearrange my face? I mean, Wait there, you're Canadian and you're blonde. So is Avril Lavigne. Oh yeah. No, it was going to be a problem, though, for me commercially. It was the same guy. I was like, it was? It was the same but, guy. But A&R said, I haven't listened to this yet, but that was the same would guy. this possibly fit on the top 10 I'm looking here on Billboard? So let's listen to the record. Uh, let's not, yeah. I just don't see Hadn't it. Hadn't even listened to the record. <laughs> yeah. I hope that artists are, that are starting out, and producers and everyone, I hope they know that a lot, basically every single thing that happens has nothing to do with their talent. It really is like 2% of it. I hope that they know that there's politics and there's people protecting their, their jobs. And it's okay. It's a business. Like, I get it. But if you're asking Paul to ask Peter to ask Mary what's going on, you're not going to get a lot of great music. Or if you're trying to make, I want to hear a Chainsmokers song again. How many times have you heard that in the last five months? Well, I mean, I'm... I'm Just because today, that's what it I is. I mean, some of my friends and fr friends of yours make those records. Yeah. And, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with and that. And they listen 
they listen to the radio and reference yeah. songs to, to do new songs. I know and, lots of people that listen to the radio, study the radio exactly, make songs exactly like the radio, then they have those big cuts that do make the money. And there's nothing wrong Which with is it. Why it's a business. It's a there job. Hasn't a, there hasn't been a genre shift in ten years. Well, if you if you want to get on the radio, you really in America, you really need to fit into certain parameters, or if you want to make money, you do TV and film. Yeah, there's you no... do one or the other if you want to make money for sure. And at some point, artist or not artist, you need to pay your rent. You need to make a living. You don't. You need to feed your kids. So you, you you can you can take the route of studying the radio. And there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean you're a sellout. It doesn't mean you don't have talent. It doesn't mean you don't have creativity. It's a job. You're giving people what they want. If you're a designer and you, or you know, a regular designer, you see what's on the runway and you make derivatives of it. And then I'm wearing it and you're wearing it. Although I'm sure you're wearing all designer. I'd like to point out that our color schism, schasm, spectrum. I know, we're schism. kind of wearing leathery things um, as well. I mean, we got yeah. my intent, myintent.com. What's your word of the day? You should do some my intent for my intent. They're very nice. Tell me nice. more about it off, off camera. We'll okay. speak about it. You just my intent. Take my intent for the world. How to make the world better. Mine's kindness. What would yours be? Just mentoring. Okay. To pass on what I get. See, I've been mentored by... <laughs> to talk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To talk too much. To no, have I an mean, interview site where I talk. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've, I've been mentored by so many people. Yeah. But I find all my mentors... Teach. Yeah, teach. Yours would be to teach. I think all yeah. my all my mentors weren't. They didn't set themselves up to be mentors. Right. I think most of the mentors are ones that have have been kind, but have also been brutally honest at times. Yeah. And I've stuck it out. Yeah. You know, I talk about this all the time. I, I have three assistants that have won Grammys. Yeah. Oh wow. And all of them, all of them share one thing in common. They stuck it out. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I've had guys that stay with me for six months to a year, and. They haven't stuck it out. No. But the guys that stuck it out, Phil Allen, yep. won a Grammy for Adele. Mm -hmm. How long was he my engineer? Nine years? Yeah. You know, even after he won the Grammy, he carried on being my engineer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's just like there there are, and it's not about me, it's about somebody that's carried on doing it and just like, just kind of, you, you have to roll with the punches. Mm -hmm. And you have to be adaptable, you have to change, you have to listen, you have to learn. You're not too good for anything. Like people, you're you you got to be humble. You're never too good to do something. You're never like, better than something. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of guys I, I admire, and some of those, um, obviously, and a couple of guys, you know, like uh, I liked I liked Rich Costi. Um, what happened with him in the early 2000s is that he did the Muse records, mm -hmm. which we all love, and uh, you know, arguably after Radiohead, like the great band of the last 30 years from England. You know, they're right up there. I mean, you have Blur, Oasis, Radiohead, Supergrass were great, you know, and but Muse, and though they're in that area of just like making great, great music. And he made those albums and they were huge worldwide smashes. And then I remember like a year later, I pick up an album, but I don't remember who it was. And it was produced by Rick Rubin and engineered by Rich Costi. And I remember just thinking to myself, two years ago, he yeah, made he a producer, Muse yeah. record and he produced and mixed mm -hmm. it and they were the biggest, hippest band in the world. Mm -hmm. But he's still good enough to go in a room and engineer because if 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 the only way you're going to work with an artist that you admire is to be the engineer, the yep. assistant, or the mixer, then do it. Do it. You're an artist. You're doing music. You're never too good yeah. for the next position. I, you could play a show for five thousand people, and then you got to start a new project. You got to get back in the van and play for fifty people. You are not too good to do that. Yeah. You are not too good to. You 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 can't be too good for anything because you got to constantly change, constantly learn, mm -hmm. do what you got to do to be, be successful or to make music into a business because sure. it's it's not cute. It's cute when you're like 18 to be like, you know, idealistic and you don't need to make money and you can do whatever the hell you want. But you you come up 10 years later and you're like, well, I'm still doing this, but sure. I got to, if you want to make it a career, it is a career that you can have longevity in. It's not like modeling or sports um, for the most part where you really have to. Are you saying I can't launch my sports career? Well, your modeling career is. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> you still got great hair, though. Thank you. Well, it's strategically brushed. Yes. But Sometimes. I, yeah. But I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, I, I couldn't do anything else. I'm, I, can you imagine me sitting in, a, in an office trying to... Right. You know, or, I, can't, I can't imagine... Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not very good at... Uh, yes. No. <laughs> no. Let's not even start what I'm not good yeah. at. Yeah. And music Listen, brings... What out, I'm not good at uh, far outweighs what I am good too. at. Me too. Me too. It's like this huge list of not good at. Yeah. 
I think also, if you're a doctor or you're uh, curing cancer or something, it's like the coolest job ever. You're physically people like saving people's lives. There's a lot of jobs, firefighters and policemen, but do, being an artist, you don't know the kind of impact you're having. But hopefully, if you're making super honest art, you're going to reach people. If it's truthful, mm -hmm. you are making, like, you take a piece of you and you're like, here. And whatever form you put it in, it's a part of you. It means it's a part of other people, too. Like, no one's, no one's alone. Everybody, a lot of people experience the exact same things in different ways. And if you're able to give them light out of the dark, that's, like, huge. I mean, we, we, I would never stop making music. Because didn't music save you? Absolutely. Music saved my life, you know? Absolutely. I was this little anxious kid that just sat in his bedroom when he came home from school, put on yeah. a pair of headphones and listened to music. What was interesting for me yeah. is I went, I went through, I fell in love with music really young. Yeah. And I always say too young in some ways because most of us, most people I meet fall in love with music when they can act on it. Right. Like they're 11, 12, 13. Yeah. They start playing in bands. Mm -hmm. I, I think I was eight when I got Bohemian Rhapsody, when I got A Night at the Opera. Yeah. And my father was already obsessed with classical music and jazz, so I grew up in all of that. And the reason why I joke about it is because it's pre-puberty. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So it, what, there was no like girls or partying. It yeah. was just like a love of music. Yeah. And I, I count my blessings that I was super anxious, borderline 15 different things wrong with me. Yeah. Like David Allen, who ended up playing drums. Yeah. Remember David Allen? Yeah. He played drums on White Pretend. I know. I was thinking, I was he's thinking, a yes, on he's Pretend. Australian. Yeah, and he, he told me, sorry, David, to throw you under the bus. He told me that when he was a child, he, he had massive depression. Yeah. But he didn't know because he yeah. was too little to understand yeah. that it was probably some kind of thing. Now he's addressed it and stuff, but he said the biggest savior in his life yeah. was learning to play drums. Yeah. I was, I had, I had a very, very dark, never enough, I had a very dark uh, teenagehood. So super dark. And if I didn't have music to listen to and I wasn't able to make music after that, I don't know what the hell would have happened. Because you could put on the headphones and you were listening to even the Counting Crows at the time when I was, uh, got, you know, that um, August and everything after. Yeah, it's an amazing album. Um, I ended up meeting him, um, Adam I after. And his, um, but something like that, and you put on a Pink Floyd, I was obsessed with Dark Side of the Moon. And you were the police who had really happy music and really sad words. And he was like, I'm so lonely. Or like, Message in a Bottle. Those first three then, albums are masterpieces. And, you know, I, that was like my music hood. And you would put that on and you're like, all right, well, they're comfortably numb. I'm comfortably numb. And it, didn't have, it doesn't have to do about drugs or anything like that. It had to do with the fact that I was like, dude, I don't feel anything. And I don't, I don't like being here. And it was just dark. And then you put it on and you're like, okay, well, that's dark too. But it still out there and it came around and it made me feel better so i always want i always said i want to be an artist I, when i'm an artist i hope that i am able someone can put on a song someone could put on a, one of the songs we've done or um acid rain people really like acid rain damn i was angry when i wrote acid rain remember i brought i brought it into you i learned i started learning how to play guitar like really badly i'm like warren like i know how, i knew i had four chords and i played it so badly and you're like okay let's get this sorted and um that's just like a couple we just did a it, that's on the record that is coming out on friday the re-release it was just so angry but i know people listen to that and they write and they're like i totally felt like i wish being misfort like in misfortune like to someone and i didn't know i thought that was like so bad of me to wish that or you know someone that's um going through chemo will listen to a song like raining that i did with a another uh, with a verona and they'll be like you know my mom was sick and i listen to that song and it makes me feel better that my mom's sick so we, we, we have this ability to hopefully do what music did for us. Mm -hmm. Because who's not dark at one point? I think about this a lot because I only want to make music like that. But then, as you're touching on, you've got all these commercial things. So mm -hmm. you're trying to, and I don't mean commercial as in pop. I just mean you have to make music. To, you have to be paid so you can continue to do your mm -hmm. art. So sometimes you don't, sometimes like any other job in the, in the history of the world, you don't always reach that goal point, but you do whatever you have to do to get to the point where you can. And it's all about making people feel less alone. That's what we, that's our job. That's our job on earth. Mine and your job 
and anyone else that's watching this that's in the you know music industry it's our job to make people at least one person if not a million people feel like they're not the only person on earth and that's what we do and all the other stuff we do on the side and the jingles and the i don't even know what you have to do i'm sure you, you got a lot of people to feed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have to take a lot of stuff on that. Uh, we do. I do a lot of work. A lot of work that I you would lot ordinarily things. be like. Eh. But I've, I've already done. By the time you'd arrived, I yeah. had a uh, Skype call with somebody in yeah. England, business meeting, another Skype call with somebody in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a lot going on. Yeah. And taking my son to school. Yeah. And it doesn't make you less of an artist. Sure. It just means it's the. Mm, the ability to merge the business with the art so you can continue doing what you love. Well, for me, the reason why I do this, number one, um, is I want to show somebody what it's really like. Yeah. Because most people that get to do YouTube, mm -hmm. I know a lot of them, and they're either professional they're professional YouTubers right. or they're at the end of their career. This is not professional. If anyone was really curious about this, <laughs> there's no hair, there's no makeup, so the glasses... In the nine in ten a.m. thing was. A She's necessity. saying I'm not a professional, Ari. You're a professional, but this <laughs> is not staged. <laughs> this is. I mean, just... you could just talk for like eight hours, and no one really wants to yeah. hear it. But we could do it anyway. Mandy, thank you ever so much. Thank you so much for having me. We're gonna Wonderful. shake hands again, the real proper British way. Oh yes, so we have a cup of tea. Yes, I love one. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It was marvelous. Um, I'm glad that we stayed in contact this whole time, and that we continue to do stuff together, and. I'm really proud of you and happy for you. And I I'm love your site. I'm proud of you and happy for you. I love Spencer. I love um, Eric and Hayden and Kasha, Charlie, Lucy. I know, it's Ollie. wonderful. Is your dog's name Ollie? Ozzy. 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 <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> What's my dog's name? Maisie. That's only because she's here. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. And yeah, it's been awesome. It's been super fun. Please leave a bunch of questions and comments below. Yes. I might twist your arm to answer some of them. I would totally answer them. I'm I I'm no role model or expert or anything on anything. Not like you. But I'm but, not um, either. I'm no Professor point. Hugh. I'm just a person that's doing it, that's been doing that's it, and that has survived. That's all I am. Yeah. I guess you've taken all the no's and the rejection and the failed projects, and you've taken the positives, and you've gone with those, and you've survived. We're just blessed to be able to do anything in music. Yeah. Living. Oh, what a blessing, huh? Mm -hmm. It's a huge blessing. Best job ever. Yep. Yeah. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing, and we'll speak to you all again soon. Peace.